I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Eric Krzyzewski. Uh, Eric is another great friend of ours on the, uh, on the external board of the Changing Cold Regions Network and also a great collaborator with Canadians through NASA's Above program, which I believe you will be talking about. So, Notice I wore my yes, you've got the check, <laughs> he's got the uh, plaid, so he's one of us. He's, he's, he's uh, anyway, so looking at Northern Canada from space. And, uh, but uh, anyway, thank you so much. Sure. All right, so um, I have a sort of an odd background here because my, um, my research interests are fire ecology and boreal systems, so I'm more aligned with Jen and the other members of the terrestrial team on CCRN. But for the past four years, I've been working at NASA headquarters on a temporary assignment where I'm had a number of titles. I'm the terrestrial ecology program scientist. I'm the above program scientist. And I'm the NISAR deputy program scientist. And actually, I'm going to be talking about all these roles here um, through uh, this talk. And as mentioned here, I've also had an affiliation with this group of researchers on CCRN and, and, and global water futures through being a member of their international advisory panels. So what I'd like to talk today about a little bit now is um, some, what I think are some untapped opportunities for the hydrologic science community in terms of using fine and medium resolution satellite data for hydrologic studies, and then at the end I'll bring it back into maybe how NASA and Global Water Futures can be looking at working together in the future. So um, as been talked about many talks here, there's, there's a lot of use of satellite data in hydrologic studies. Jay gave a very nice talk on GRACE in terms of looking at large-scale water storage. Uh, we just heard a very good talk about rainfall and monitoring with remote sensing. Um, there's a lot of use of microwave radiometers, looking at a variety of surface characteristics at fairly coarse resolutions. MODIS imagery is quite heavily used within the communities. Um, one of the things I think that the use of satellite data emphasizes is the international nature of satellite data. Meaning once you put a satellite up there and if you have a open data policy like NASA does where it's freely available to anyone who wants to use it and you start generating and producing data products, it really becomes widely used and it's not just restricted to one country or one sort of group of users, it's really broadly used. and so. I think that's one of the things I'm proudest about NASA's legacy here is that they promoted this data policy because they don't view remote sensing data as a, something to be sold or bartered. It's really something for the public good and to use out there. Um, so I think one of the challenges here is that we do have a lot of what I would call medium resolution. When I say medium resolution, it's in the, the 10 to 30 meter range. There's a lot of data sources out there. Um, and there's actually, um, with the Worldview system, we're actually getting data at fine resolution available now. But there are some restrictions that have prevented the widespread use of generating data products from these systems. Uh, this includes basically, um, up until very recently, just um, limitations on how much data can you process and store. Uh, up until maybe just the past decade, we've really seen some advances that I'll talk about that's, that actually makes this restriction go away. Um, there's also the frequency of data collection issues. With, with the Landsat sensors, there are cloud cover issues that restrict how much data you can get. Um, just because, uh, especially at high northern latitudes, you just don't have that many cloud-free days. Um, with the radar systems, they're active systems that have their own power systems, so they, they just can't be turned on all the time and collect data. They have a duty cycle, so they're restricted that way in terms of the amount of data that can actually be collected. And then there's also restrictive data sharing policies. So, a lot of your SAR systems are, from the European perspective, Japanese perspective, 
have not had an open data policy. They've had a restricted use. Um, and actually, the radar sat, satellite radar sat too is a quasi commercial system, so they have a very limited amount of data available. Um, but we're overcoming that. I think, I think the cloud storage and processing systems have really revolutionized the, the ability of people just to get their hands on a large amount of remote sensing data and then be able to process it. Google Earth is actually not, now has a Landsat data archive within its system and ability to process it, so people are beginning to do that. Within NASA's above program, we have a science cloud, so we have all the remote sensing data available, uh, or a lot of remote sensing data sets available for our domain, and, and we're, we're looking at different ways to process and analyze this data. So there's, there's that restriction's coming, coming, becoming less and less one we have to worry about. Um, NASA actually is, has, um, teamed with other federal agency users to actually start archiving and collecting large amounts of world food data, especially north of 60 degrees latitude on a global basis. Um, the data itself is restricted to U.S. federal users, but data products are not. And I'll show you a data product that we're generating through above that is available, that will be available to people. Um, we're actually working with the European Space Agency to start generating combined uh, or merged Landsat Sentinel-2 data sets that actually increase the frequency of VIS-IR data. Um, and then there's, a, there's really the exciting thing to me is the deployment of new SAR missions within the next few years. Uh, Sentinel-1A and B, which was completed in 2016, actually now makes it possible to collect data, SAR data, on a global basis of about once every 10 days. Uh, the radar set constellation will have similar capabilities because it's based upon three satellites operating in, in, together with actually it includes radar uh, uh, frequency of collection. Uh, SOUCOM is a um, South American satellite that was scheduled to be launched later this year is LBAN. And then NASA is planning to launch NISAR um, in 2021. I'll talk a little bit about that. It actually has the capability to collect data twice every 12 days. And it's, the, the frequency is based upon the orbital consideration because you're doing it ascending, descending passes. So it's not every six days, but it's twice within a two-day, 12-day period. And then I think a, a, a major step forward here is that ESA, for, um, as part of the Copernicus program, has, has implemented a free and open data policy for the Sentinel data so that, that now we have another data stream that's going to be available. So here's a data product that's being produced by NASA's above program. We're working with the Polar Geospatial Center at the University of Minnesota, who's actually working with, under various contracts, to actually compile these worldview data sets. Um, and what they're doing here is they're actually using stereographic techniques to generate a two meter horizontal re resolution uh, DEM product for the entire above study domain. It has a uh, four meter vertical resolution uncorrected. If you have ground control points and go through some additional processing, you can get that vertical resolution down a little bit better. Uh, we're still working with them to fill in the data collections for the south of 60 part of the above domain, but this data set will be available to the above science team of which m members from Global Water Futures and CSRN are uh, part of that team, so that will be available to use. Um, a very interesting product, I think, that was recently um, um, developed as part of Mark Carroll's PhD research was basically what he did is he processed all Landsat scenes from a study area in northern Nunavut 
from 1984 to 2015 using data from June to September. And um, what he did was he developed an algorithm to map, map lake area or open water area in this region. And his study showed, I think Al, you mentioned, how many lakes did you think Canada has? Well, in this study area alone, there were over 675,000 uh, water bodies greater than a tenth of a hectare in size, determined from Landsat imagery. And by looking at these data, um, what he was able to show was basically over this 31-year period, you had quite a, quite a bit of variation in, in, in water coverage in the region. It actually decreased by about 10% over a 10-year period, and then it went back up. Um, there are certainly distinct trends over the 31-year period where small ponds less than a tenth hectare and large lakes greater than 10,000 acres were actually decreasing in size, but then the, all the other ones in the middle were actually increasing in size. And if you really look at this, there's actually geographic patterns in the way in which the lakes were decreasing or increasing. So you really have the ability now with Landsat imagery, now that these data are available and you have the capabilities to process the system to actually map surface water at a 30 meter resolution on an annual basis. Um, my own research is focused on radar. Uh, I came from a radar background. I worked at a lab in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan that actually invented imaging synthetic aperture radars focused SARS. And uh, so we've, we've done studies on looking at mapping wetlands using SAR and what can we tell. So we had one study in southern Florida sponsored by EPA in the early or late 90s where we established some, some monitoring sites in the different wetland types down in, in the great, uh, what is it, the um, Big Cypress National Preserve. So we were looking at marl prairies, wet, cyp wet marshes, hat rack cypress, et cetera, et cetera. And we actually collected data over a two-year period. And in order to get this ERS data, we actually had to write a proposal to the European Space Agency on, for a research project. And then they basically granted us access to the data. And the way that the orbits were set up back then in the data collection policies, we were able to get 22 images over a 24-month period. So back in the previous days, if you wanted to do hydrologic studies, you, could, you were lucky if you could get a, an image a month, which really sort of says, well, you can show you can do things, but if you want to use it for monitoring, it's really going to be tough. Um, but what we did, we basically, the nice thing about this study site is it, it has a a very distinct wet and dry season driven by seasonal precipitation patterns. So what we were able to do is collect data over three wet seasons and two dry seasons. And if you really study the imagery here, for example, this is the Florida Everglades right here. This is the southwestern Florida there. You could really see patterns of dramatic change in radar backscatter in these different wet, uh, wetland types as you go through these different hydrologic periods. And so just a quick primer here on the way, what radar works is that you're actually getting three sources of radar backscatter. You get it directly from the ground because a lot of the energy goes through the canopy. So it's, this, this signal here is going to be proportional to soil moisture. And then you'll get some from the vegetation canopy but then when the canopy floods, I'm, I'm getting there. I didn't see you with the hockey stick up there for other people, John. <laughs> so in any case, you'll get a different signature where you'll get forward scattering and then interaction with the vegetation canopy. So you can really see these patterns here so that when the, when the canopy is not flooded, the signal is proportional to the soil moisture. And then when it's flooded, 
you'll see that the signature is proportional to the water depth. And so when you're looking at wetlands, this is really an interesting tool. And so one of the things that we've done at headquarters is we've, we've queried our different agencies, federal agencies, and how they use remote sensing data. And one of the um, um, outcomes of this was that they said if we had high resolution frequent radar data, we would use it for soil moisture monitoring as well as monitoring wetlands. So we've actually gone to the Office of Management and Budget with an increment to get the capability to, to collect all data over North America at high resolution, at, at quad polarization. And the reason we need an augmentation is because the SAR systems collect a hell of a lot of data. It's 9.1 terabits of data increase in the data cost in terms of downloading, so we just need more downloading capability and storage capability for this product. We'll also, we also have a, a proposal in the OMB to actually process the, um, the NISAR data using the SMAP soil moisture algorithm. And so if we get this augmentation, we will also be producing a soil moisture product twice every 12 days at about a 250 meter resolution on a global basis. So, in summary here, I think there's a lot of future opportunities in terms of NASA and, and interactions with the, our Canadian researchers, especially with the global water futures. We're going to be pursuing development of these advanced remote sensing products throughout this project. And hopefully, if there's an interest here for collaboration, some of these advanced hydrologic products could be one of the things we focus on. I think there are some challenges here. Um, I think it would be great if we get radar sat constellation SAR data for the study area, but I think that would require a groundswell from our Canadian colleagues to say, change your data policy, Canadian Space Agency. Um, I think there's a real opportunity here for people within the hydrologic community, given the availability of the data, to start promoting the generation of these data products from, from medium resolution satellite data. NASA sponsors the lot, lots of projects focused on generating data products used by the scientific community. And so if there is a push by the hydrology community for these products, there's an opportunity to get these products generated. And then I think we still have to work on fostering these collaborations between our two groups. And with that, I thank you. So, I, I mean, I agree with Eric. There's some issues with CSA that we've got to sort out, and we should start lobbying. I, I, for the radar set constellation, we're pushing really hard to get fine scan coverage over prairie potholes, right? Because they're undetectable with, with the larger pixels. And so, we've been pushing hard, and, and they don't want to turn the fine scan on for, for, uh, for the prairies, which is kind of interesting. So, I think we need to get our thoughts together with NASA and CSA and talk about water with respect to some of the radar products because it's not quite coming together as it should, I think. I don't know how you feel about that, Eric, but I, th I think that's... Yeah, I think so. I, I think the thing is, is with the radar sensors, there are two different wavelengths that will be very complementary. The, the L-band radar will be much better for forested wetlands and the, and the, uh, the, the C-band radar from radar set will be much better for non-forested wetlands, so... They're yeah, very the, complimentary. And the other thing, John, is we, we really need to think about, um, over time, archiving these as, as climatological products at the end of the day, right? Taking these things and making them into rasters or whatever we do, but, but keeping them as a, as a climatology because that's going to tell us a lot about what's happening on the landscape. So.